Hello and welcome to this Blueprint Institute event. My name is Harry Guinness. I'm the CEO of Blueprint Institute. For those who don't yet know us, we are an ambitious new think tank established to enrich public policy with evidence-based research consistent with market principles. Some of our values which guide our work are the belief in social progress, valuing our natural environment, fiscal responsibility and hard-headed economics. Before we get started with today's discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands of which, on which we all meet. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm really excited to welcome our panelists today, uh, many of who need no introduction. Amanda Vanstone was a former minister in Howard's cabinet and a former member, member of the National Commission of Audit. Judith, Judith Sloan is a contributing economics editor at The Australian. Nikki Hutley is a partner at Deloitte Access Economics. Richard Holden is a professor of economics at UNSW Business School and a strategic counselor at Blueprint Institute. And last but not least, Stephen Hamilton, who's the chief, exec, uh, the chief economist at Blueprint Institute. Um, don't get ahead of yourself there. Steve. Yeah, not yet, mate. <laughs> and, the, um, and an assistant professor of economics at the George Washington University. So, our nation uh, has a hell of a hill to climb. The COVID recession will reverberate through our economy and society for many years to come. In times of crisis, tensions can be exacerbated and the effects of government policy can be heightened. It's with this in mind that we face the federal budget next week. Earlier this week, Blueprint Institute released our budget blueprint, which offers a template to deal with the competing pressures on the nation's economy, society, environment and on public debt. We argue that Australia needs to embrace big reform like at no time since World War II. A fertile ground is required to put Australians back to work, to get our economy growing again and to pay down our sizable public debt. This can be achieved while protecting the natural environment and ensuring that vulnerable Australians are not left behind. But clearly it's a complex complex task and there's much for government to consider uh, in steering the nation out of this emerging recession. In fact, the first in three decades. What is less clear is whether the upcoming budget will be up to the task. So hence the, the reason for today's discussion. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful uh, to our panelists for joining us and can't wait to hear their views. We've got some of the nation's leading economists and public policy commentators to help untangle this and, um, and answer that very question about the upcoming budget. So let's get started. Um, Stephen, I might start with you. What did you make of the Prime Minister's speech today? Uh, did he rise to the challenge that we set in our budget blueprint earlier this week? G'day, Harry. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me here. So. Uh, yeah, the PM gave a speech to the press club today outlining uh, sort of his vision for manufacturing in Australia, outlining five key areas of, of focus for the government. I think it was an excellent speech, I would say, one of his strongest. And I was impressed that instead of focusing on too much on, on the today, he was very focused on growth coming out of the crisis, which I think is going to be extremely important. And that's a big theme in our budget blueprint. Um, but, you know, I have some reservations about exactly how he wants to go about that. And, 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 on, and a lot of those things, we'll have to wait till Tuesday to, to, to see the detail. Now, um, in, our, in our budget blueprint, we sort of make the, 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 the case that this is a budget that has two seemingly competing priorities, right? Which is this need to, to introduce massive stimulus in the next uh, 12, 18, 24 months to, to, to get people back into work and to get the economy growing again, which is going to require a significant increase in public debt. Uh, but then to build reforms today so that the, 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 the economy grows rapidly following the crisis uh, so that we can pay down some of that public debt in, in the years ahead. Now, going into the crisis, we had you know, more than a decade of stagnant productivity growth. Um, the, the, the step down in productivity between the 90s and the, the post 2000 years is, is really stark. Uh, wages growth has been stagnant for the past 20 years, right? So even going into the crisis, it's not like the economy was booming, right? We needed reform leading into the crisis. And now with net debt headed towards at least 36% of GDP next year, 
we need reform to boost growth as quickly as possible. And so I think the risk for the treasurer uh, is to kind of lose the wood for the trees, right? To, to be focused too close to the here and now and not be thinking about the, the challenges that are on the horizon. So for us, that, that's things like tax reform. I mean, the Henry Tax Review, I'm a fan of some of it, not all of it, right? But it was a solid piece of work. And I think you could take a lot of the great ideas that came out of that project and, and build a tax reform agenda from them. Instead, it was ignored. The government set up a tax white paper process. It killed it and we never heard anything more about it. The government was, was, was supposed to release an intergenerational report in June. We didn't see anything of it, right? So my, my concern really is this is the focus on long-term reform. So in things like tax, uh, getting industry working again, encouraging R&D spending, which has been tanking for the last 10 years, building higher education up as you know, our third biggest export sector. And more importantly than frankly, all of those is, is, is getting our, our economy decarbonized uh, and, and figuring out ways to, to build comparative advantages on, on a sort of green energy future. So, you know, they're just a few of the areas that I'd really like to see uh, uh, focused on in Tuesday night. Uh, and I think we have to wait and see, um, uh, you know, whether the treasurer uh, steps up to that sort of that, that, that expectation. Thank you. I thought that, um, if I just jump in here, that actually yeah. what he alluded to at the press club today, the Prime Minister was suggesting, um, you know, that there, those are some of the things that he is focusing on, certainly around skills, um, you yeah. know, something around R&D, with, with whether manufacturing is going to ever be, you know, what some people think it might return to be, I, I'm, I'm dubious. But I was actually quite surprised, because often it feels like economists are saying all these things and have been forever, and nothing, nothing ever gets listened to. Whereas um, I'm really quite hopeful off the back of some of the things he said mm. today, with the exception of the decarbonisation. I don't think they're getting very far on that one. But, but no. the, that, that they are thinking long term, possibly at the expense of the short term. Yeah. I mean, if I just jump in there, Nikki, I mean, I think that's a great observation. I was, I was hopeful based on that, that speech today, for sure. Although... You know, again, we didn't hear anything about tax reform uh, as we as we never do. And and the other issue is, you know, this focus on picking winners, I think, is a, is a real concern. So, you know, today he emphasised five priorities. And, uh, you know, as an economist who, who believes in markets, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea for the government to pick the industries it wants to win. And we got the same message from Angus Taylor's speech last week, which was here are the five winners in, in green energy. Right. We we tried to pick the car industry as our winner for decades. And we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on car industry jobs because of that. Uh, and it didn't get us very far, right? So I would like to see a focus on building Australia's markets up, right, to produce those winners of the future. But, you know, again, it remains to be seen. It's, Stephen, I mean, I think uh, it's pretty small beer what he was talking about, actually, in those uh, six sectors. Um, you know, <clears throat> they're going to be quite small grants. And, I mean, in many ways, I thought the speech was important because... He acknowledged the importance of the framework and mm. in a sense, I think there's more politics in nominating those sectors more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and indeed, of course, there's politics in the whole manufacturing narrative. You know, we know that people think we should make stuff. Um, and I guess there are security implications of making some stuff too. So, <clears throat> but I would go back, um, Harry, to thinking about the budget in terms of you know, the immediate backdrop to this is almost unique, right? This is not a normal recession. This is a recession that has been induced largely by virtue of the restrictions imposed for public health reasons. And of course, it's also a worldwide uh, uh, recession uh, in a way that, of course, there have always been sort of worldwide drops in economic activity, but not quite as coordinated uh, as they are at the moment. And, and that, of course, is a bad thing, not a good thing, right? Uh, you know, the drop in world trade has been quite significant. <clears throat> and that's, uh, even though Australia's exports in um, uh, the commodities have held up, everything else has, has dropped like a stone. And I mean, I think, Stephen, you're right to be talking about some of the sectors that you know, it will continue to be affected by the restrictions. So anything that's reliant on the international movement of people, 
uh, including, of course, tourism and higher education, is going to continue to be hit as far as I can see. So there will have to be some sort of sectoral element in the budget. But uh, when you think about what's going to happen next Tuesday, you know, we'll go in and start reading the papers with a completely different mindset to the kind of mindset that we normally would. You know, the forecast, the projections will be made up and no one will really care much about them. Um, and I think certainly from my point of view, and, you know, it's always boring if we all agree, but I'm less concerned about the immediate stimulus, but I'm more concerned about the quality of the spend because I think we don't want to be locking in measures where the costs are clearly much greater than the benefits. You know, I, I can see that the quality of the spend has already de de deteriorated. You think about some of the rorts with JobKeeper in particular. So I'll be looking particularly at that. And I mean, Amanda, she might like to say something here because, you know, she did live in a world where there were budget restraints and constraints and, you know, decisions and trade-offs had, had to be taken. Uh, my fear is that by sort of lifting those constraints, the quality of the government spend might deteriorate a lot. Indeed, well, Amanda, how different is this budget to the... the, the very, very, very different. When the Howard government was first elected, that made a decision that it would pay down the debt. And that meant uh, there were very hard decisions that had to be made and it isn't easy. Um, no one's ever happy to be told that they're not going to get this anymore or they're going to have to pay more for that. That's always hard. We're in different times now where people recognise money's going to have to be spent, that money's relatively speaking cheap, and they're looking for that to happen. So these guys, in one sense, uh, are, are, have a dream opportunity, um, but only if, as Judith says, the money is spent well. Uh, I could give you countless examples on both sides of politics, with both sides being in government, where the intention has been good, where the policy plan has been right, but it hasn't been executed properly and it hasn't been spent well, where, where um, rorts creep in that you just don't imagine at the time are going to happen. Um, we've seen that recently with the, the job seeker one, we saw it in childcare, we see it everywhere. When there's a big bucket of money, and that's what there's going to be in this budget, when there's a big bucket of money, there's a big bucket of people who want to misuse it or get in there and get their slice. So uh, that's a serious issue. What, what I'd like to see is um, not, with respect to the others, not too much of a discounting of the focus on the immediate stimulus. You know, if you've lost your job, you might be about to lose your house, you are very interested in immediate stimulus that will get things going and in that sense you that they might look at I, I don't know but things like where uh, local libraries schools councils etc can bring forward their capital improvement programs uh, they are I think the term is shovel ready I know people want to look at long infrastructure programs but you know don't tell me they're shovel ready I've seen those things they take years to get going before the money will ever get down on the ground so I'd like to see a little bit of a focus on the short term but I'd also like to um, Stephen do what uh, Stephen has suggested, if not in the budget, not long after, and that is look at some serious reforms. This presents an opportunity where on all sides people recognise the need to come together and look for some decent things to do, and uh, I hope the government um, capitalises on that. Uh, well, we saw it a bit with um, Christian Porter bringing in the unions. So I thought that was a very... To have a discussion about what we could do with IR, I thought that was a very positive move. The more of we can we can see of that, the better. Brilliant, thank you, thanks, Amanda. Richard, you you've spoken this week about the um, the way in which Australian commentary has an unnuanced way of describing economic policy. You said that people and policies are either neoliberal or Keynesian, heartless or reckless. Can you tease out what that means for us in the context of this budget? And does the Prime Minister and Treasurer have an opportunity to break away from tired ideologies to, par, um, to pave a new path? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Harry. I think they do. And, and I think they've already shown that they're, <clears throat> pardon me, starting to do that. Um, I, I think there's sort of a, a narrative in Australia that becomes very binary. It's that either, you know, you're, you're fiscally responsible or as... Um, Certainly some Liberal MPs like to refer to themselves as the party of thrift. 
um, you know, or you're, you know, a reckless idiotic spender, you know, throwing money away and allowing a lot of rorts. And, you know, as with most things, most things, the reality is usually somewhere pretty much in between. And I think what this will allow the government to do, particularly when it comes to some of these reforms that do hit the budget bottom line in the short term, um, is to be able to to be able to commit to those. So, you know, I was I was critical when they announced it. I was supportive of the enterprise tax plan. I thought we should cut the company tax rate immediately for all companies in Australia, regardless of size, to 25%. But of course, it was going to be phased in over 10 years, um, and that was precisely because people were worried about the four-year Ford estimate period. And it was precisely the attitude of all the people, myself included, in the budget lockup that Judith referred to at the start of this conversation, where people were going to sit there saying, oh, dear, you know, minus $6 billion, four years, and then you know, what about five years out into the projections? And we're going to get that kind of discussion going on. This presents an opportunity where the number's going to be negative something very, very large. So who cares? whether it, you know, when the cost of government funds is 90 basis points for 10 years, do we really care whether it's minus 90 or minus 104? It doesn't matter um, in, the, in the short term. And so I think it's going to allow them to do some of these things that, that frankly, any good government would have wanted to do. But the narrative around debt and deficits, this kind of fetish, fetishism of balanced budgets on both sides of politics, for that matter, I think is going to be shrugged off by this and it'll be a good thing. Um, Harry, I might come in here and I, I think I agree with you, Richard, because, you know, and Stephen, I noticed that you'd worked in the Treasury. You know, the thing is, there are sort of no policy induced benefits really factored into those future forecasts. So you take the case of the income tax cuts. There's this almost hysterical analysis of are they fair? You know, are high, high income earners paying enough of a share? And, uh, Paul Kelly dealt with this in his column this week. Whereas like, I think the more interesting issue is how does the income tax schedule affect people's um, decisions about working and investing in their education and skills training, right? And, and Harry, it sounds as though the Blueprint uh, Institute is really interested in this sort of thing, right? So instead of worrying how much they're going to cost next year and the year after that, I think some of those supply side reforms that can actually ultimately have a very positive effect on the budget bottom line, they don't get factored in well at all, and they don't get discussed at this time. Um, and, and I mean, the, the other example was with the, the company tax cuts. It was all, you know, you look at the, 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 you know, all those charts they have of the deficits and the debts and all that stuff. Um, now, I think, um, Stephen, you might like to come in here. I think that they would regard it as too speculative to be modelling those sort of you, what you might call, well, I don't want to really call them second round effects because, and if, you know, it's why you're doing it, really. Um, but, you know, they're not, it, it's all, you know, basically a lot of the figures in the budget are the equivalent of drawing straight lines. That's um, right. And... But the way it's, it's accounting. Written, it's accounting, not economics, yes, Judith. So it, so the, but then the way it's sort of handled by the commentators and the journalists is that they kind of think this is the truth. You know, this is going to be the number in 2025, 20, 26, and you go, yeah, right. You know? So the US, in the US, the, the Congressional Budget Office, um, which is a really great institution that, that does all their costings of, you know, proposals and, and budget, budget proposals and things. They have, they talk a lot about this thing called dynamic scoring, right? Which is all about taking into account these behavioral responses. I mean, I worked at treasury about 10 years ago and, um, and, and I remember the first time someone uh, incorporated a behavioral response into a costing and it was like a, ce a celebratory moment. <laughs> <laughs> where the, the behavioural elasticity was finally uh, making a difference to, to, to the costing. So you're right. Um, uh, company, I mean, we try and do modelling around these things. It's very uncertain, obviously. Um, but, and we don't want to go as far maybe as to say we're on the other side of the Laffer curve, right? But it is true that a lot of these reforms generate revenue, right? That helps, that helps at least helps to pay for themselves. I think uh, one of the things Judith said made me think of this about people looking at lines and saying, well, are we going to get to that point in here and making a big issue of that? You wonder why. Um, that's a reflection on the media coverage we have of this and other things where 
uh, for some uh, journalists, not, not all, but some. Uh, you know, the smartest thing they think they can do is, is catch someone out and saying, you estimated this amount and it's not that, so aren't you an idiot? Uh, really, that shows them to be an idiot but themselves, I think. But that, but that doesn't uh, help the, the public get a better understanding of what's going on. It doesn't help them have confidence in the process. And that in itself, I think, is a dampener on reform because if, if you're going to run that risk with reform that you're dealing with a, a public that are ill-informed by your media, uh, you can get into trouble. Can I say just two other things? Uh, I might be the only person in Australia who thinks we're going to come out of this much more quickly than other people do. Uh, that's because I'm not an economist, probably. Uh, but just, the, you know, to the extent that you're most things you read, I, I, I think this is going to be deeper than the, the GFC. Sure, sharp and quick. But I think we will come out of it uh, earlier. And what I take from that is not, oh, well, don't worry. I, I say you haven't got long while this real crisis is here to grab these big reforms and do them. Because once people get a sense that we are getting better, they'll lose the appetite. Uh, for that, that sort of reform. And the last thing I'd like to say is, you know, I think the Howard government made, um, and I hate to admit uh, in hindsight mistakes, but there were a couple. And um, one of them, I think, was in, for example, family tax benefit, where uh, there was money there. Um, it was a, a locked in to spend. And of course, it's, you've got to keep spending it. So I'd be cautious about locking long-term things in that you are going to have real trouble changing, keep the things that allow flexibility for future governments. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good principle. Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree. I think we can't completely discard the option that there will be a snapback. I know that was a term that... Uh, snapback, was, is that? Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Morrison used that term. It was perhaps unfortunate at the time, but... You know, um, without, with, it, with, with the exception of those sectors which will be still subject to restrictions, um, I think, uh, you know, you can't completely discount a fair degree of snapback and therefore you don't want to be locking in things that should be temporary. Uh, and, you know, of course, um, you know, uh, Swan and um, Rudd made that mistake too in response to, uh, to the GFC. Um, uh, and I mean, I know, so Stephen and I are up here in Queensland. I had a cup of coffee with our local member the other day. And I said to him, so what are the big policy issues up here? And he said, no one can get any staff, right? So no one can get in. And this is quite across the board. So it's not just the farms and the picking of fruit and the like, but it's in the cafes and even administrative jobs. And so see, job keeper is, and to a degree job seeker, are creating problems in the labour market because they offer high replacement incomes. Um, but, you know, we effectively have a two-speed economy. We have the other states um, and we have Victoria. Uh, and that's created, I think, a very big policy dilemma for the government because, obviously, these are national settings. Um, and I agree, we have to be very sympathetic to the plight of a lot of Victorians, being a refugee from Victoria myself, um, and that, I think, makes policy a whole lot harder. But, uh, you know, that's why I, that, that, that supply side issue is a very big issue here because, um, you know, job seeker with the family tax benefits and the other bibs and bobs means it's not worth a lot of workers to take certain jobs. And, and that is becoming an issue. And I know it's one that, uh, that Morrison, well, Nikki... So our research is showing at the moment that for every job that is advertised, there are a minimum of five applicants, right? So there is a shortage of jobs, jobs, unemployment. I'm sorry, I really have to strongly disagree with your premise that there will be a snapback. We know unemployment takes a long time to come down, even in the best of times. If we, if we followed the, the route of the GFC, it, we're still looking at a couple of years away. Um, we are not going to get it through this crisis. And there'll be many jobs that just won't come back, either because firms will need to cut costs um, to, to make up for all the lost revenue, or because they're investing in technology because we're seeing huge changes take place. COVID's been such an accelerator. So I think, you know, the argument that, that, um, that, uh, that the, the coronavirus supplement, um, which, is, which is giving people, um, you know, $1,100 a fortnight compared to the minimum wage, 
which is $1,500, and most entry level jobs are above the minimum wage. That idea that there's a disincentive there is, is really not, not proven, and nor is the, the research that we've just done around job vacancies. I know there are people who say they can't get the right staff, but I'm not sure that that relates to what anything to do with job seeker supplement or job keeper. It's maybe to do with skills. And we know also from our research, huge skills um, imbalances across all sorts of sectors, and there are massive shortages. But, you know, the, the, we constantly seeing stories about, you know, somebody the other day talking about applying for a job, working in a kitchen, basically washing dishes, and was told 600 people had applied. My own son-in-law lost his job at the start of this. Luckily, he's found something since um, in the hospitality sector. But he applied to, to do, you know, he was applying for anything and everything, applied to, to go and stack shelves in, in a local Coles and was told the same thing. 350 people had applied for one local supermarket job. So we've got to be just careful about blanket saying, I'm sure there are people who are not using this in the right way, but I would suspect that the small rotten apple is not is is not the whole the whole barrel. Can I Sorry. just can I just make sure that I don't get lumped with the snapback? What I'm saying is, it should be in Scombo used. Um, I, I didn't hear that. I, I just think the recovery will be quicker than the GFC. It doesn't mean it'll be instant, um, but it'll be quicker and. Um, what you say is is exactly right in terms of uh, Nikki. What business learns that, for example, years ago they learned they could do without the tea ladies because there was a downturn and tea ladies never got their jobs back. Business learns in hard times what they can do without, and they learn that lesson and like it because they then want to keep the profit. So I understand very well um, what you're saying there, and that that I don't mean it's going to be rosy. I just mean it's not going to be anywhere near as bad as people imagine in two or three years' time. Not anywhere near so, as they imagine. I think so let me right. just, yeah, let me just jump in there on the on the question of sort of job seeker and other reforms. So the thing that I find in Australia is an incredible lack of ambition in terms of designing programs in a kind of you know well thought out, sophisticated way. So if I look at job seeker, it's uh, an extremely the normal rate. It's an extremely low level, right? I think it, it's if you look across the world, it's like extraordinarily low income level. And it's the same level, no matter what your wage was before your unemployment spell. And it lasts forever. Like we're the only country in the world <laughs> that does that. It's absolutely crazy, right? And, I, and I'm here on the Sunshine Coast, uh, Judith is too, right? Uh, there are people here who are professional welfare recipients, right? And that their, their weekly task is to go and submit faux job applications to every cafe in the, in the, in the, in the town. And, and, uh, my coffee shop owner here says, even in good times, you get you get applications for jobs, and you, you've got hundreds of people applying, but none of them are serious, right? So, I, what I want is not this obsession with numbers that we get from our reform, like what's the tax rate or what's the rate of 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 job seeker, but like let's think about a sophisticated way to design these programs that's smart, right? So, a job job seeker, an obvious answer would be have the right tied as a specific proportion of the formal wage like it is in so many other countries so that it's a proper form of unemployment insurance have it be generous and for a time limited period have no mutual obligation conditions right and, and we know from the economic research that doing that actually giving people time to search for the job that fits their needs improves job matches and increases economic efficiency Right. So we've got to get out of this bizarre trap where we think there's constantly this trade off between equity and efficiency and realize, actually, we can design things smarter and get both. Right? Well, you're you're, you're um, arguing to agree with Judith that you want quality of spend. Exactly. And I think Australians want quality of spend. You know, they know when there's a program that's a, you know, a useless piece of bureaucratic. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and they say, oh, what, what idiot designed this? Uh, you know, the man in the street, he, he, he's not as stupid as people think. And, and they want things that work. Yeah. And look, I Let think me tell it's, it's Oh, sorry. No, you go. Point, you know, because, um, you know, we had the sports rorts affair last year and we've got some little mini sports rorts affair up here in Queensland at the moment, spent by some minister I'd never heard of. Um, but, you know, arguably, this is going to be small beer compared to what with if what could possibly be coming down the track if we don't create measures to ensure we have quality spending, you know. Um, 
you know, uh, Richard and I have spoken about this. We've got, I think, so, you know, all sorts of people regard this as an option to reform. And, you know, the trouble with that term, Stephen, is that that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I think on the left, they think this is a great time to introduce a universal basic income, right? So a minimum income for everyone, uh, including Gina Reinhardt and Twiggy Forrest, because they need it. And also for modern monetary theory, you know, so just get the Reserve Bank to start printing the presses and we can spend whatever we like on any, anything that anyone wants to put up, basically. So, I mean, I'd like Richard to come in here because I regard this as quite threatening, frankly. And, you know, you know we, we might, uh, it might have made life a little tougher for Amanda, but there was a lot of value to society in you having to analyse the costs and benefits of various spending options and disappointing people, you know. That's what, that's what I think good spending involves. I, I agree with Judith that there are, there's sort of amber claims for all kinds of things going, going on. And, and I think that understanding that we're, we're at a moment where there's a need for a large amount of spending, where deficits for a while, you know, the exact size of them is really not that important. Breaking the narrative that we have to have zero government debt at all times or that zero government debt at any time is in fact some kind of optimal level. Breaking that narrative is good, but, but moving away to, you know, an unlimitedly large Green New Deal or, or you know, printing money, um, you know, would be, would be a crazy thing to go to. And I, I think one of the things that's comforting about Australia, I think this picks up on maybe Amanda's point about, you know, your, your average voter, your average punter is pretty cluey and kind of gets it and can, you know, can, can smell something that's wrong pretty far off. And the idea that you can print money, something that's been rejected, you know, print money without consequence, is something that's been rejected by economists like Janet Yellen and Larry Summers and Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz and Ken Rogoff, you know, across the economic spectrum, um, or across the left-right spectrum, rather, by all mainstream economists. Larry Summers is called a voodoo economics, and I think quite rightly so. And you know, if Bernie Sanders became president of the United States, that'd be on the table. That'd be a real thing. Uh, I, I don't really think that that's, you know, part of serious discussion in Australia. I don't think any major party in Australia would take that up. But it's important that, that the debate still be, be grounded and that, you know, it's good to break down some of the narratives that have been there. But, um, you know, we have to sort of keep an eye on this kind of spending. And I think just quickly picking up on something that Stephen said, that the CBO in the US does, you know, performs a very, very valuable role. I think the PBO in, in Australia, the Parliamentary Budget Office, does here too. But I, I think its role could be expanded and it could look at things along the lines of dynamic scoring. And so just to pick up on what, you know, Judah said, the idea that when analysing, say, personal income tax cuts, no one's trying to take account of labour supply elasticities, that when you get to keep more of what you earn, you might decide to try and earn more. Um, you know, something that economic theory and, you know, good microeconomic evidence, you know, has told us is true for a very long time. The question is, what's the magnitude? The idea that that's not factored in to the analysis, I think, is, is a shortcoming and something that could be, could be remedied over time. Let me just jump in there, Richard. Uh, the a little known fact is that P Parliamentary Budget Office doesn't do its own forecasting. The forecasting's still done in Treasury, right? And if you've worked, I've worked in budget to Treasury, you know, there is there is some judgment involved in those forecasts, right? They're not, they're not, you know, they're subject to all of the same issues that anyone working at Treasury is subject to, right? So one well, something that we proposed in our budget blueprint is to move those forecasts to an independent place. So the UK government did this coming out of the GFC. They set up an office of budget responsibility, which is completely independent of the British government to provide like certainty and clarity to their economic forecasts to make sure that they were free of uh, uh, political uh, interference. And yeah, so beefing up their PBO or setting up another body or something like that, that does all of these, you know, that pushes the boundaries and envelope on this sort of, um, the, the, the information that we can use to make good decisions, I think would be a great change. Just picking up on that quickly, sorry to come back in, but I, I think that is a very good idea. It would also have a flow on effect in terms of um, encouraging 
you know, thinking carefully about a lot of these policies. So rather than things like inland rail getting fought out in Cabinet, basically as an arm wrestle between one minister and another, or one party and another, or one um, parliamentarian and another, um, it, would, it, would be, it would be really assessed in some sort of real cost benefit kind of way. And one of the things that, um, you, you know, work that I've done with Rosalind Dixon a few years ago, trying to think about the, if you like, the social internal rate of return or taking more seriously the idea that when we think about a lot of these policies, often the costs are very easy to estimate. So imagine you thought that lengthening the school day was a good idea. It might be a good idea, it might be a bad idea. It's pretty easy to figure out what it costs to lengthen the school day. You know, you need more. You need more teachers. You might need a, you know, a few more pencils. You might need a bit more electricity. You might need a bit more insurance. Trying to figure out what the benefits of that is, you really need to think about the social science. It's not an accounting exercise. It's really, um, you know, an, an economics and social scientific exercise about, you know, what are the pros and cons of that in terms of what kids learn. How does what kids learn translate into what they earn later in life? How does it translate into other outcomes? And so. I'd like to see a body like that also start to carefully think more seriously about accounting for a broader set of benefits or costs that we might get from various different policies. I think that would elevate the quality of policy discussion in the country as well. Actually, if you asked my daughter with her fortune, she'd say abolish school holidays. Um, but Harry, this is a really important point, I think, for the Blueprint Institute because what economists, I think, are kind of good at is thinking of the bundle. So you mentioned, for example, our poor productivity performance. Um, and, you know, you have to think that the, the, the way we tax people and tax resources, tax enterprises, is sort of, you know, one of the problems, right? So, uh, and it all also relates to innovation because if you've got a really good idea and you set up a business and it succeeds, you know, um, you know, you honestly have to wait about, uh, you know, 10 minutes before you're earning the top marginal tax rate, you know. Um, and you kind of worry in a world of international capital, mobile capital and um, until recently internationally mobile people. I mean, they probably look at our top marginal tax rate and think, gosh, I'm not going there. Yep. You know? Sorry, can I just get back to actually what Richard was talking about, which is around good cost-benefit analysis. And just to, to, to build on that, there are lots of us that actually are doing triple bottom line cost-benefit analysis. Yes. We do this for governments. We're getting better and better. I think that's one of the things that Deloitte Access Economics does incredibly well is to, to be able to do things like, you know, the, 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 the value of, of, of amenity or, or, or social outcomes. Um, through a whole range of um, revealed stated preference choice modelling, those sorts of things. Um, and we can do that. But it's not that there hasn't been a cost benefit analysis or a business case done for inland rail or for many government projects. We get involved in a number, not that specifically, but uh, and often when the result isn't what the government wants, it gets buried. Now, the mandate needs to be you will have transparent business cases published on every single major expenditure item. And obviously you can't do it, you know, for every little thing, but when you're talking about spending billions of dollars of taxpayer money, you absolutely should have accountability and say, we, you know, we can never be 100% certain about some of the changes that will occur. But if we think about, for example, a fast rail is a great one. You know, everyone's talking about time travel savings. Well, it's not real benefits. But if you talk about, well, what does that do to the shape of our cities and greater access to jobs, um, you know, increased participation in the workforce because people affordability of housing and reduced financial stress and families, there's a million different ways you can go down and build up the case for these things that doesn't just look at, at one individual, as you, you said, Richard, very narrow economic frame. So I'm, I'm all for, for, for us building on, on those, those cases um, and making sure that, that governments are far more accountable in the decisions in the decisions that they make uh, inevitably there will be poor ones made um economists are not infallible either but um you know we, we could do a lot better and we could be far more transparent not just about the independence of our forecasts but the independence of our cost benefit analysis and, and the business cases that, that underpin major spending can we, can, thanks. Speaking, so, sorry speaking of business cases um yeah, i i agree um nikki i think that transparency of the 
things that come together to make a public policy are a good thing. Uh, no disrespect to the big four, but really um, business cases need to be in a comprehensible form that the man in the street can read it when it's published and understand it. And, um, you know, consulting firms talk about moonshots when they really mean a good idea. Uh, so for everyone, including the, the public service, if we could just go down to using plain English, that would let, guess what, the man in the street, you know, the, all men are created equal, everyone has a vote. The people who actually are the basis of this democracy. If we could have things prepared in a way that enable them to participate in the discussion, um, that would be a very good thing. The, the other thing I'd like people to remember, uh, Nikki, having said, I think this will pass more quickly than people are, are imagining, um, uh, not, not necessarily snap back. Remember what uh, the slave said to Herod when, he put, uh, Herod when he put the gold crown on his head, he whispered in his ear, this will pass, meaning all the wealth. And I understand that's what helped a lot of people in the Jewish community in concentration camps saying to each other, this will pass. We need to remember that this bad economic time will pass. I've been through times when unemployment was nearly 9% for years. It's passed. It's come back again. Uh, and we also need to understand that cheap money will pass as well. There'll be an end to that. And that's why we need to be careful. Thanks, Matt. So how do we make most of the stimulus available now? Can we reflect a bit on the social implications of the recession and those in society who have felt the brunt worse than others? What policies should, should we be looking for from the government next week to boost female participation rate in the workforce and to protect vulnerable Australians, such as those who are subject to domestic violence? Well, I can say we shouldn't spend more m money on research on domestic violence. Universities must be full of research that's been paid for by various governments into domestic violence and not read by anyone other than academics. So my first requirement in that area would be get down to the people who work in the shelters, uh, who work in the, um, the law firms that deal with us and get some good ideas from them about what will work. Don't pay for more research. And, 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 and that would be across, across the board in a whole range of areas. Don't just give money to uh, bureaucratic organisations that do things. Go down to the person who needs it. That would be, if I were back in Parliament, that would be my first policy rule. How's this going to get down to the ground? That's what matters. And the workforce? Anybody? So I, I do quite a bit of work in this space, um, including for something known as the Financy um, Women's Economic Progress Index. And we quarterly look at different measures of um, women's economic progress vis-a-vis -vis men, and, and there's some very stark um, differences, but one of the key things is around um, unpaid work. Uh, women in families, uh, two-headed two families uh, with, with kids do twice as much work per hour of unpaid work per hour of paid work. So this is not talking about where you have one partner that works and one that doesn't. So we need to have, there's a whole lot of things here that are cultural. We need to encourage girls that, guess what, having you know, two X's doesn't make you bad at maths. Uh, we need to encourage and foster that right from the word go. We need to do greater things um, in the firms and lots of firms like mine are, are doing more where we have paid parental leave for both partners. We have programs to help, you know, progress women more, more um, quickly. We have actual quotas in place to try and ensure that the, the leadership and, you know, this takes, stuff takes time. Uh, but one of the things I think in, in amidst all of that cultural change, we need to understand that women make choices to, to pursue lower paid careers. And why is that? Is that something that's inherently part of female nature that we prefer to do more caring jobs? Or is it because we think it's going to be more flexible and, and, and aligned with, with a, a you know, part-time career if you choose motherhood somewhere along the line? Um, if we have greater sharing of roles for those who want, then that's, that's not it. But Probably the biggest thing is access to childcare at a reasonable rate. Now, Judith, be pleased to know I'm not advocating for universal free childcare. I do think it needs to be means tested, but um, you know, from an affordability perspective, we know that for women, uh, you know, the, the the sort of fourth and fifth days that you work, basically, um, it in, you know, it, it's tax on you to to work more than part time. The way our tax system is is structured, so the cost of childcare. Encourage, you know, discourages women from going back full time. That discourages us from having greater diversity in, in all sorts of positions of, of leadership. And it just ends up in this, this vicious cycle. So 
There are a million people alongside myself and far more informed than me who have put forward a whole load of policies on this front, but the one I'd advocate for most is around access to, um, to childcare, as well as the firms actually making it easier for women to work, to work flexibly, uh, and men to, 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 to know that it's okay to take up uh, caring responsibilities if, if that's what they want. Nikki, I think right. oh. that's, that's exactly right. Uh, government, successive governments have completely messed up childcare. We've now largely got a, a system that the bureaucrats designed. It suits people who work nine to five, largely in Canberra, uh, um, and because it's designed there, nine to five people. It doesn't suit other people. And I, I, I really think we should move to something more like tax deductibility for work in the home. You can put all sorts of limits on that so multi-millionaires don't have PhDs looking after their kids because they think their kids are genius. Um, but... <laughs> You know, uh, access to childcare is just so important, and that's what's holding so many women back from from progressing and getting further in the career of their choice. And if we don't bite the bullet there soon, we're going to be lumped with this ridiculous industry that we've got now. That every, you know, we put put up grants to families for childcare, and the price goes up. Nothing changes. So let me. I mean, I live in Washington D.C. normally. And if, if, if America is leading Australia on social reform, I think we're in deep trouble. Um, my, my house in DC, I have a, a school, a local school that my three, when she was three, my three-year-old daughter had a place in, right? Every single kid in Washington DC who is three or four has guaranteed pre-K education, guaranteed, every single one, right? So. I dropped her off at 8, 820 in the morning and I didn't have to pick her up till 6 p.m. Okay, so uh, if America can do it, it's kind of embarrassing that we can't, right? So I, I, I know Nikki pushed back on, you know, uh, universality, but I think universality we know is extremely important to, to get social acceptance for big reforms, right? So I'd like to kind of see the start point of public school start two years earlier, right? And, and get uh, every kid in the country who's three or four at school, right? And, and, and the lessons that my daughter has, are, it's like school, right? Uh, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, and then you can, of course, have childcare, you know, that, that's privately provided for one, two, one, one and two and two and a half year old kids, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's a great, a, great, a great thing. And we have so much economic evidence to, to support the productivity benefits for the kids, right? Of early childhood education, especially underprivileged kids. And then, the, and then the, I mean, massive productivity and income benefits for the mums, right, as a result of that reform. So it's a sort of no-brainer, I would say. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't do anything to help the nurse who, who doesn't, who's working, say, four days a week and she doesn't know uh, all the time which day she's going to have off, but the childcare centres demand certain mm. times off. And for those few years before you get to your early uh, education, mm. you want to produce, that's a real problem for them, shift workers mm -hmm. and people with variable... You know, night workers and people with variable shifts, it's just a nightmare. We've got to come to something that's much more flexible for them. Yeah, look, I think this is a complicated topic. I totally agree with Amanda, though, spending more money on our current system. I mean, it's been a squirrel in a cage. So, you know, they now spend over $10 billion a year and there are still all these complaints. I mean, it's, all, it's always been the case that uh, from day three and a half to four and five, uh, that, of course, is partly because of our tax transfer system that you end up paying a very high effective tax rate if you continue to work, um, you lose various benefits and the like. But, um, I mean, I know, Richard, come on, come on, I know you're not a woman, but you can participate. I mean, you have been part of a debate which has suggested that we should move to a tax deductible or tax rebatable system. Um, yeah, like so. But, you know, I, part of the I, trouble I, at the moment is that it, it's very difficult. I mean, I have a daughter in Melbourne with a, a toddler, and you know, it's thirty-seven dollars an hour to have a nanny. So who can afford that? I mean, she's she's a doctor, but um, it's a very expensive option, right? Um, well, the plan the plan that I put forward was to say allow people to choose between the existing scheme. So if you like the existing scheme, the existing scheme makes you better off, stick with that. Or you can take tax deductibility as an expense for childcare, including nannies that you spend up to some amount, like $60,000 per year per household. Well, right? flood out of you, they will flood um, out of the existing system. I, I agree with you. Give families... I, the Amanda, I'm, to I'm, talking, I'm, but I'm talking for childcare yeah. centre-based 
or nannies or whatever. Um, and, and the beauty of giving people the choice between thing is nobody is worse off. And in fact, the modeling that we did on that, um, and Ben Phillips at the ANU was very helpful in running that through, through his model showed that actually people in the second bottom income quintile are some of the biggest beneficiaries from that precisely because of the perversity of the high effective marginal tax rates in our, in our system. And that's before accounting for the benefits of labour supply and other benefits that might come from it. So I agree, the existing system is not working well. We can reform it, but I think we can also do it in a way that, that makes everybody better off. Brilliant. Um, I should get to some of the questions from our audience and apologies for neglecting the, the great list of questions that are here. Um, the first I'll ask from Tom Ackhurst. Is there any space for creative disruption after COVID? Or borrowing from the hystericist the theory, which says that temporary increases in public expenditure reframe expectations, is there irreversible expectation now among businesses that government will uphold failing industries? They better not be. Perhaps, um, I mean, the, the, the Prime Minister's um, speech today uh, very firmly placed manufacturing at the heart of his vision for the recovery. Uh, what, what's an economic perspective on picking that particular industry and, and why are we picking that over education, uh, services industries or, or anything else for that matter? Harry, so just quickly, mate. So I, I, the, Australia's top 20 export industries, 13 uh, mining and agricultural resource sectors. Uh, the other six are services education, tourism, financial services, IT, and one is manufacturing, which is beverages, right? So if we want to drive uh, industries that we have comparative advantages in, I'd be focusing on services. And uh, if you care a lot about services, uh, you've got to look at the, the higher education system in Australia, and you've got to be despairing at the massive reduction in revenues that they've received as a result of COVID. And 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 my and I and I and we have a pretty strongly worded section in our report about higher education and the fact that university administrators bear a huge amount of the blame for the situation they're in. But regardless, I think we're going to get real about yeah. funding higher education, right? If we're going to build a smart country that can be service driven over the next, you know, decades. Um, you see, that's the, the thing is that there are trade offs, right? And so if you look at where there are a lot of skill shortages, they don't require university education at all. You know, there are people like, you know, bricklayers and carpenters and plumbers and electricians and boilermakers. And so I, I, I feel we've, we haven't got that balance right, actually. And that young people leaving school too often think that university is what is suitable for them. When in fact, if you think vocationally, um, that often be better to head for the trade option than to the TAFE option. And um, you know, I think the research is very clear that if you compare a 25 year old, someone who's got a vocational education qualification, certainly above certificate level three, has very high rates of employment compared with university graduates. So, you know, this is something I think, and Amanda, of course, you were the education minister for a long time. It is an important uh, policy area to get a sort of balanced response because vocational education has been too, too often the poor cousin of, of the debate. I, I, I'm sure it has been. Uh, uh, I, and I think the public feed into that. Um, having an attitude somewhat similar to Hillary's remark of the deplorables. You know, if you don't have a university education this, these days, there, there are people who treat you differently and they shouldn't. You know, you've got the same uh, intelligence as someone who has a university degree, you, or you may have, but you just may not have the acquired knowledge that they've got. And uh, I think one of the real problems is we, because we've been so keen on promoting education, we've pro promoted university education and not a broader education, including uh, for the skills that are needed. And, and part of that is because uh, everybody wants their kid to go to university, whereas really, you know, if you want your kid to be happy and successful, you might do well to look elsewhere. We try to, to get our kids to go and be 
um, you know, boiler makers and, and what, what gas gas turners because we reckon every time the central heating breaks down in the middle of winter, <laughs> you, you, you're up for hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but they all went to university. But university is not just about teaching people, it's about the research. And, you know, we're yes. seeing now how important that is. And I think, you know, what I take out of the what the Prime Minister said about manufacturing, the, the bit that I like about it is, is where R&D in those sectors, and it shouldn't be just in those sectors. You're right about it. Not, not, you know, I agree with that. Not picking winners, but we do want to encourage research and development more in this country, and we want to be able to then take that R and D and be able to commercialise it, which we haven't done as well as we might. And I don't care what sector it's in, but it, politicians all the time talk about, um, you know, the, the value of precincts. And what's at the heart of every precinct? Education, education and health, education and fintech, education and something. And it's about the higher education, the research that goes on in those institutions that's absolutely critical to that high, high value growth in new firms, higher productivity, which we are essentially going to be relying on for our growth because it won't be from productivity or, or participation. So, you know, they, they, they're right at the centre. Yes, not everyone should go. That's, you know, just as important. But the research part of this equation for if we are going to have a high growth future in this country, or at least a moderate growth future, we cannot ignore research and, and, and universities are a fundamental part of that. Certainly agree with you there, Nikki. Um, the PM's focus today on, on, on the gas industry and a gas fired recovery, is that, is that a path um, to, to growth? And can I ask for, um, kind of perspectives in an economic framework, um, where do you see gas infrastructure taking, um, taking the nation? I'm not an energy person, don't ask me. <laughs> well, Harry, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think that, you know, back to this theme of winner picking, um, I thought some of the language that was used a few years ago in this debate used by you know, some members of the current government or former members of the current government about being technology neutral was extremely important. And the bottom line is, until we have a price on carbon, we will not get the right technology produced and we won't get the right technology adopted. We'll be guessing, we'll get it wrong. And until we get a price on carbon, we won't have the incentives for market participants on the production side or on the consumer side, on the adoption side, or on the business side as users of energy um, to get things right. And I think it's fine to be backing certain technologies. I think it's fine to have a roadmap. The idea that you can solve this incredibly large problem, all of the elements to it, affordability, reliability, um, dealing with the social cost of carbon, cannot solve those without a price on carbon. And the sooner the government wakes up to that, the better. Uh, yeah, but we're not yeah, going yeah. to have a price on carbon. Uh, and That depends on what people like you say, Judith. So I, I, I don't give up. So and indeed, there are places around the world that have a price on carbon and it's still terrible because they have all sorts of stupid interventions, for example, in Europe, right? So it might be necessary, but it's definitely not su sufficient. We do, of course, have prices on carbon. We have all sorts of shadow prices. I mean... Subsidising renewable energy involved imposing a price on carbon, by the way. Um, so, look, I, I think when it comes to gas, uh, I think the bottom line is that for the country, it is a good thing to unshackle the impediments to the exploitation of a resource we have and to do something with, for example, the pipelines and the way that's... Uh, administered. There are strong oligopoly elements in, uh, in the gas industry, it, right through the chain, as a matter of fact. So it's hard to see how the country loses out by unshackling those, those constraints. Um, I mean, I think the Prime Minister is a bit sort of smart when he says gas picks itself. Um, the key, you know, the reason that gas has become a small part of the energy mix in Australia is that it is too expensive domestically, right? So this is all fa factoring in a lower gas price and a lower gas price based on global, global gas prices. So um, uh, I think we'll have to see. But again, I think as long as it basically involves unshackling 
the constraints, then we should go for it. I'm not sure I'm keen on the government. Uh, I mean, look, everyone picks winners. Uh, but, you know, the government probably should try and do it as, 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 less, as less as they can, as least as they can. Judith, the, the last part of your comment there, I think, is a wonderful way to end. Um, every government pick, picks winners and the, the keys do it in the, the most effective way possible. Um, I, yeah, uh, thank you so much for your comments today and, and for the audience attending. We, we, we do need to wrap up. Um, it was a wonderful and lively discussion. I really appreciate the degree to which we were able to have a frank discussion and, and um, uh, dispel some of the, the myths and mythologies around the federal budget and the broader economy. So thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll finish up now. Thank you. <laughs>